So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, and any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. May God bless the reading of his holy word. I read an article on the Harvard Business Review titled, Proof That Positive, positive Work Cultures Are More Positive, or, or More Productive, rather. Proof That Positive Work Cultures Are More Productive. And the article speaks about how a highly competitive ethos at work is not sustainable over the long haul. Many assume that a cutthroat environment would push employees to perform better and faster. However, recently more companies are realizing that a high pressure culture is rather costlier and, and harmful to productivity long term. And so it goes on to speak about how a positive environment has more benefits. And it goes on to list six characteristics, essential characteristics of a positive environment. I'll go through the list quickly. One, caring for being interested in for colleagues as friends. Two, providing support for one another. Three, avoiding blame, forgive mistakes. Four, inspiring one another at work. Five, emphasizing the meaningfulness of the work. And six, treating one another with respect gratitude, trust, and integrity. And I think we can summarize these six characteristics with one word, and that is humility. Yeah. Humility. And all this, is say, all this is to say that it's taken a couple of millennia, but modern business philosophy is finally catching up with the wisdom of Christ that we see in Philippians 2. So I want to begin by asking ourselves the question, what do our churches look like to the watching world? Uh, when, when they look through the windows and the doors uh, of this church, how do they see us interacting with one another? Do they see peace, love, unity, or do they see us competing with one another, or jockeying for position, or selfish ambition, uh, gossip, or envy? What is the DNA of our church, or our, our churches in our world? In our passage, Paul calls the Philippian church to cultivate humility in their fellowships, for the sake of gospel unity and witness. If you recall, Paul was in prison in Rome, writing this epistle. And, and so now imagine you're, you're, you're a member of this church of Philippi, and your very leader is in prison. You would be scared and even concerned. And, and on top of that, you're facing the pressures of the culture. Uh, in that Greco-Roman world, people were obsessed with status markers and prestigious titles. The, and the humility was considered a weakness and an impediment to success. 
And so you have all of these different pressures, persecution and, and cultural pressures pressing upon the church. And what can often happen to the church is we can become tempted to compromise and give in to worldly ways of doing relationships. Um, we can start to become self-centered. Isn't it true of your personal lives as well? When things get hard, when we're so afflicted with troubles, we can begin to excessively wallow in our own uh, troubles, and I'm not undermining your, your pain, but we can become so excessive that, uh, that we become myopic and forget that there are brothers and sisters also struggling and wrestling. And so it's, what, we, what, we can, what, can ten, what can often happen is we can cave in and, and the church can begin to isolate themselves from the world. And when a spirit of self-preservation and pride is not subdued individually, it can eventually disintegrate our fellowships and even cause divisions. And a house divided against itself cannot stand. It will hurt our witness, and it's not the way those who are citizens of the heavenly commonwealth are to conduct themselves. So, so what is Paul doing here with this epistle? Paul is writing to the, the Philippian church. He's, writing, he's, he's, he's wanting to encourage and fortify the Philippian church in the midst of what seems like a hopeless situation. And, and Paul is saying to them, I want you to know, beloved, that God is using even my persecution for the greater progress of the gospel. And the first directive he gives in this epistle is a call to church unity. He says, stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And he takes up the same theme of unity in chapter 2. And in verses 3 to 4, he talks about humility because true unity is community built upon humility. And so he says, avoid all selfish ambition, conceit, and have an other-oriented attitude in all your fellowships here. And this humility is the mind that Paul refers to in verse 5. He says, have this mind among yourselves. I believe the, 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 old, the, the good old King James translation actually fits better with Paul's exhortation in this context. The King James says, let, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So what, in other words, the mindset that he's calling us to have is the same mindset that Christ Jesus had. And so Paul is holding up Jesus as the greatest example of humility so that we too can have the same humility in our fellowships. So I want to first of all look at uh, his example. First, Christ-like humility is not selfish. Christ-like humility is not selfish. And Paul here begins with his divinity. Verse 5, he says, Who though he was in the form of God, form of God. When Paul says in the form of God, he's saying that everything that is essential to God all that marks God is bound up in the person of Christ. He is all that God is, the very being and the essence of God, co-equal with the Father. He is a true representation of the being of God, the image of the invisible God, Colossians says, the radiance of God's glory, and the one who is God did not seize his divine prerogatives for his own selfish gain, for his own advantage. Verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is, he didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. 
He didn't regard his divinity as something to be held on to too firmly. Or uh, he, he didn't see it as something to be exploited. The richest person in the world, if you, if you guys know, um, is Jeff Bezos. Recently, I think, according to Forbes magazine, his estimated, estimated net worth is $131 billion. $131 billion. And, and you ask, why, why does a person... Why does a person hold on to $131 billion when it, where more than half the world's population is living, uh, is living le on less than $5.50 a day? Why does a person hold on to that much money? Well, it's, it's because it's his by right. He earned it. At least we think he did. And... <laughs> That, that's, I mean, but, but the point is, this is nothing compared to the wealth that Christ possesses in heaven. Jesus being in the form of God, surrounded and worshipped by tens and thousands of angels, the God of God, the light of light, and yet he refused to use his power and authority for his own gain. This is remarkable. And that's not how the world thinks about wealth or privilege. The world teaches us that the secret to success is to find unfair advantages and to climb the ladder as much as we can. And when you have a lot of power or social capital, the temptation is always to take advantage of it and to exploit it and to, to accrue more power or to keep power or wealth for selfish gain. And Jesus knew all about this. Jesus understood how the world operates. He said, the kings of Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Luke 22. Now, there's nothing wrong with using advantages for our own benefit or for wanting a profit or wanting a job promotion. But when, when self-interest becomes self-infatuation, when, when, when th that's when it becomes a problem. When th that's when it becomes idolatry and greed. It's when we solely use these advantages solely to per serve our own personal agenda. When our fundamental orientation is, is what can I get rather than what can I give. And so, and, and isn't this how the world thinks about wealth and power? But again, here is the one who created everything and owns everything, and yet he does not grasp at the honors of heaven, which are his by right. He does nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And this is the humility that Paul speaks of. And Paul is calling the church, have this mind in you. Rather than, and Christ, we see, rather than selfishly holding on, he let go. Rather than seeing his divinity as something to be exploited, we're here told in verse 7 that he emptied himself. Look with me in verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? Of course not of his divinity, since Christ cannot cease to be God. So, rather, by emptying, we mean that he set aside his visible manifestation of his glory. Um, he, veiled, he veiled his glory for a while. And he emptied himself, how? By, we're told here, by becoming what he was not. He made himself nothing, by adding to his divine nature a human nature. So he emptied himself not by, as theologians say, not by subtraction, but by addition. And so do you see the condescension here? The one who created everything and sustains everything submitted himself by becoming dependent on, on food and, and oxygen 
and, and he exposed himself to violence and hunger. But the Son of God, he didn't just become a man. We're told here that he took the form of a slave. And you have to understand that in the social rank of the Greco-Roman society, no one can descend lower than a slave. This was a deep drop in status. And in a society full of social climbers and grabbers, where people are encouraged to climb up, Jesus here, he's climbing down the ladder. And so to the original readers, this would have been strange at best. And he didn't just come down. As one rapper says, he, t- he took a quantum leap. He surfed the chasm. And so between being God and being a slave, this is the widest gap imaginable. And Paul would... Paul wants us to see the contrast of contrasts from lordship to servanthood. The uncreated one, now a creature. The possessor of all riches chose a life of poverty. Foot washing was something so debased that according to one commentator, the Midrash, that, the Midrash said not even a slave could be commanded to wash feet. Yet Jesus stoops down to wash the feet of his disciples. And you may be wondering, how was Christ, how was Christ able to lower himself under the lowest of all while knowing that he himself is the Lord of the universe? How, as the king of the universe, is he, normally kings don't do that, even though they should be. They don't. And so how, how do they do that? I mean, humanly speaking, it's hard for us, even us, when you're with a person who is below you, um, however you objectively determine that value, uh, maybe someone who has less on their CVs, or, or maybe you have a college degree, uh, or you just shine in every department. Somehow you objectively determine that you are actually more privileged or Uh, more gifted. And when we know that, we tend to have um, we tend to have a superiority complex towards that person. And and we we think that because that person is below you, um, that person should be serving me. That person should be respecting me. And so it's hard for us, humanly speaking. So how, how was Christ as king of the universe? Was, was he able to go down so low to serve even lepers and prostitutes? How? In love, he was willing to count us worthy of the service. He, he was willing to count us worthy of his service, even though we didn't deserve his service, even though we deserved the opposite of his service. Even though we deserved rejection, he counted us worthy of his service. And beloved, if you are struggling to find any reason to worship today, consider this King Jesus. If you are are struggling, you are downcasted and and just, just afflicted by troubles in life, consider this King. Jesus was willing to become your servant, beloved. We, we, we so forget, we, too often we forget that. He was willing to become your servant knowing your sin, knowing, that you, knowing how often you would promise and fail to keep them. What kind of king is this that he would willingly humble himself beneath his subjects? And he is inviting us through the, the, the Holy Scriptures, he is inviting us to be like Jesus, to willing to serve one another. True humility, because true humility is always willing to serve and willing to become the lowest person. And so Paul says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ 
Jesus. But how often and how quickly do we settle for our convenience and for our own comforts rather than our sacrifice? How often do we complain, oh, I'm too good to serve this way or, or this task is beneath me? How often do we posture ourselves as kings rather than servants? Here is Jesus, who is actually the king and makes himself the servant of all. He chose to forfeit his comforts, forfeit his reputation, and forfeit his pleasures for our eternal good. He considered our need for redemption more significant than his comforts. And we praise Christ today for that. But when you may have thought that Christ cannot go any lower, he reaches crescendo. He abased himself to serve us with the gift of his precious life. Verse 8, we're told here, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We see you see, he not only made himself subject to men, but also to sin and death, and, even, and bore it all for us. And it's interesting here that Paul, here, notice Paul doesn't say in this, uh, in this verse, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the Father's will. That's not what he says. Of course, the word obedience reminds us that Jesus was the true Adam, the suffering servant, the one who was obedient to the Father where we were not. That's all there. But Paul here, he's more concerned to tell us that he became obedient to the point of death. In other words, the focus here is not so much on the object of his obedience or to whom obedience was given to, Rather, the focus is on, is on his, the extent of his obedience. So here is an obedience that drove him all the way down to the darkest pit for our sake. A heart so absorbed of God's glory and of others. And so Paul can say in Galatians 2.20, Christ is the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Jesus said, you remember that? Jesus set his face. He set his face towards Jerusalem. And he willingly journeyed to the cross. He willingly journeyed to the cross with all the knowledge that his death entailed. Even though he could have called unto the Father and sent thousands of angels to, 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 to destroy all his enemies, he didn't. He, he, he willingly journeyed to the cross. And he knew it all along prior to creation. In eternity, when he agreed to the covenant to accomplish salvation for us. One pastor says, no king, no king gives up his life for his people. They give up their lives for him but not with the king of kings. So beloved, do you see how low he descended for you and me? But it wasn't just any kind of death. It was death even on a cross. Notice here, Paul, he breaks the pattern of the poetic structure by adding an extra phrase. He adds an extra phrase, even death on a cross. And so Paul is highlighting here, here's the climax of his humiliation, the lowest depths to which he descended. He wants his readers to know that people of high status would never die on a cross. The crucifixion was the worst punishment. It was the most shameful form of punishment. It was reserved only for foreigners. It was reserved only for terrorists. And, so it, was and it was placed out in the open for maximum pub publicity. 
and for maximum shaming. And so, and for the Jews, anyone who hangs from a tree was considered cursed by God. And so imagine, imagine the humility it took Jesus to endure such shame. They nailed him with the metal that he created to the wooden beams that he spoke into existence. Imagine the humility it took the innocent one to subject himself to God's curse for sinners. And only one man has ever felt the unmitigated curse upon himself. What humility that he would be willing to become a curse for us and give his life as a ransom for us, for his own. Beloved, there is no greater humility in this world. No one has ever started so high and no one has ever descended so low. What is this teaching us, though? Remember, this is in the context of Paul's exhortation. He's teaching us that a life lived to humility is willing to be disregarded, is willing to suffer even and die for God's glory and for the flourishing of others. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Humility is not, humility is not becoming a doormat. It's not letting others, that's what I used to think, but humility is not letting others, it's not letting others trample over you or, 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 or submitting to abuse or something like that. Um, no. So I think if I, let me, let me put it in more practical, concrete um, uh, 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 examples. What does that look like for us today? It might, ordinarily, ordinarily, it might mean sacrificing an evening of your favorite te uh, television show to spend more time with your family. That's humility. Or it might mean allowing someone else to take the spotlight, even though you know you did most of the work. That's humility. Sacrificial humility. Or it might mean caring enough to gently confront a brother or sister who's living in sin to restore them instead of succumbing to timidity. Or it might mean giving a listening ear to someone who's in need of encouragement, even though you're pressed for time because of school or, or work. It might mean relinqu relinquishing some of our freedoms and rights for the sake of the other's flourishing, which could mean risking our own reputation and safety to care for the, the least and the last in our midst. These things are all, hum these are all ways to uh, to, 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 to call, uh, practice humility as Christ did. Yes. One commentator says, Christ recognized no limit to the extent to which his obedience to God in self-humbling must go. Whatever he found in himself to be expendable, he spent. While anything was left which could be poured forth, he poured it forth. Nothing was too small to give or too great. This is the mind and the life which is commended to us by the example of Christ. Christ's pattern and example comes to us with the force of the law. Christ is primarily our Savior and Redeemer, our mediator, but secondarily, He's our example. And, and it comes to us, and his life is an, a, a, a rule of obedience. And it comes to us with the force of the law, and it reveals to us, all of us, that we all lack it. And I was deeply shamed as I was uh, uh, exegeting ex or uh, interpreting this text. Because we all lack it. Our churches lack it. Um, and there are some of you guys here, I know, that are, are way ahead of us, others, in this humility. Um, and, and we need you to, we need you to continue to model for us. 
You are a huge encouragement to us. But even the most humblest of us, uh, we all need to grow in this. So, so, the, so the question that I want to leave before we end, to leave with us before we end, is how can we cultivate more of this mindset? How can we have more of this humility in our fellowships? And I believe the key is not just to beat ourselves with this imperative. It is not just to try to think harder like Jesus. The key is to sit at the feet of Jesus and marvel. Marvel at the greatest humbling this world has ever known. It's, it, the, the, that's what I believe Paul would have us to do here when he puts this beautiful hymn to Christ here in this text. He, Paul would have us, as he holds up the paragon of humility, the greatest example, not just so that we imitate him, but that we meditate on his humiliation and that we worship him. Pure, uh, Richard Sibbs, his insights here are gold. In his sermon, The Art of Self-Humbling, he says, he shows us that humility is not the vain attempt to think less of myself. That's just another form of self-infatuation. Rather, humility is an inevitable result of having a softened heart. And so, one point of application, meditate. Let us Meditate on this, uh, on, the, on Philippians 2. Uh, keep it in the front of your minds. Whenever we're talking to our brothers and sisters, whenever we're interacting with one another, keep this in the front of your minds because humility comes when we have been standing in the awe of who he is and what he has done for us. It's when you realize you're an unworthy sinner and yet he humbled himself to great depths to redeem you so you can be humble. He became like us so that we can become like him. And so, beloved, let the gospel take such deep roots in our hearts so that you, don't, you grow to see this call to humility not just as your duty, but as your joy. And we, we want to rejoice in this calling. Because, think about it, because if Jesus spent everything for me, can there be anything in this, any pleasure in this world that is worth grasping onto that tightly for my personal gain? There's nothing. How can I consider my humble Savior even for a second and refuse to humbly serve my neighbor? It, it, there's no way. There's no way. There's, there's a watching world that desperately needs to know Christ. They need to see the glory of his humility. So what will the world see in our churches? Not just New City Fellowship, but all churches. What will they see? Will they see unity and humility? May the Holy Spirit Enable us to have this mind that through us, the world would see Christ and be drawn to him. Yes. Let's pray. Yes. Great, humble Savior. Lord, as we consider this text, we realize how amazing and how great your descent was from the very heights of heaven. You've decided to, to humble yourself, to come beneath us, to, to serve us and to even die for us, for our sins, even though when we didn't deserve it. Lord, remind us of this humility. Lord, we get so caught up, we become so myopic, uh, so self um, so it's just concerned about ourselves, especially when things are going hard for us. 
But Lord, help us to, to, to be other-oriented as you call us to through this text. Because, Lord, this is it's not just a duty, it's a privilege that we get to come and, and, and be humble amongst each other. So Lord, give us your Holy Spirit to enable us more and more each day to serve one another, to sacrifice one another. Lord, we love you, we praise you for your great humility. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.